I got burglarized. <laughs> we need some more communion wine. Let's call the insurance company. They'll take care of it. <laughs> Let's be honest. They're probably not using communion wine. They're probably using grape juice. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they stole all the Welches. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Hey folks, welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competition, and the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I am your host, Lloyd Bailey, back in the saddle again after a week off, and this is episode number 117, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Cook'sHolsters.com. Yep, I am back again, recovered from surgery, ready and raring to go for another week of Armed Lutheran Radio. I want to start off by thanking Pastor John Bennett for filling in last week. I thought he did a great job, and I really appreciate him uh, filling in there. I had a uh, Clinging to God and Guns segment that I had recorded previously. I try to keep a couple of those on hand just in case something happens and John and I can't get together to record a segment. And I just pulled that one out and plugged it in, and and off we went. Thank you all for your well wishes and your prayers. I'm feeling back to normal Uh, more like myself every day, hoping to get some range time this week, which I haven't been able to do. Sergeant Bill is again leading Team Armed Lutheran Radio without me uh, at the Texas State IDPA Championship this weekend. We'll be hearing more about that in the future, I'm sure. Um, May is a really busy month coming up. Next weekend is the uh, NRA annual meeting in Dallas. I'm really looking forward to that. I've never been to the NRA um, annual convention I had to cancel last year and, and didn't get to go, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Sergeant Bill and Aaron and Mia will be there with me, so if you're planning on attending, be on the lookout because we will be there and we'll look forward to seeing you as well. I'm looking forward to seeing some, some friends that I um, uh, made at uh, GRPC uh, and uh, seeing some people for the first time that I've uh, not gotten a chance to meet face-to-face, including our own Mia Anstein. Um, then the weekend after that is Grant Cunningham's two-day threat-centered revolver class at Mission 160 in White Wright, Texas. I've got to get out and get some practice with the revolver and, and get ready for that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Mission 160 is really expanding, putting in uh, extra training bays, uh, offering lots of new training classes. They've hosted uh, J.J. Ricaza, of course, the Grant Cunningham class coming up. Sergeant Bill just finished a two-day class with IPSC world champion Ben Steger, and um, uh, Mission 160 is going to be hosting an IDPA sanction match in um, October, I believe, the North Texas Regional, which you'll hear more about in the coming months. Next weekend, uh, the the weekend after the... um, the Grant Cunningham class is the baccalaureate for my son's graduating class, and then the weekend after that is graduation. And I've got family coming in from North Carolina for that, so that should be a lot of fun. Uh, Monday looks like I'm going to be uh, cleared for action by the doctor, at least I hope so. I feel good. So then I can get back to my regular routine, and um, looks like I won't be uh, shooting any sanctioned IDPA matches f- at least until June or July, but that's fine. I'm really rusty. I just need some, uh, I need more practice and, and some local IDPA matches before I um, give any sanctioned matches a try later this year. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody, this show is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. It's an awesome group of pro-freedom podcasts, which include the Polite Society podcast, Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns, Gun Freedom Radio, and many more. Um, many of those uh, hosts you've heard on this show in previous episodes, um, our own Mia Anstein, her Mac Outdoors with Mia and Leah podcast is uh, now a member of the network. And But since then, 
we have added five new shows that I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, Brian Duff is the host of Mind for Survival. Uh, the um, the brothers Jaeger, Chuck and Kevin, host Survival and Basic Badassery. I recommend checking out their latest episode about urban scavenging. I laughed out loud a couple of times. It was really fun stuff. I appreciate their, the shout out that they gave me. Uh, Tactical Pay Radio with Brett Grayson is another show that's joined the network. Um, it's an interview show about the firearms industry, and they've got some pretty cool guests. Uh, just saying, check out episode 10. <clears throat> um, and then Riding Shotgun with Charlie is the newest. Charlie Cook, the creator of the Gungram videos on YouTube. He's also got a video channel where he, he drives around in a car and interviews people who are riding shotgun and uh, they talk guns and politics and the second amendment and training and music and life and all kinds of fun stuff. Well, Charlie has turned the audio from those interviews into a podcast and he is now a member of the network. Uh, A fifth show is coming up uh, soon, probably going to be uh, next week, which will bring the lineup to, uh, I think 17 shows. So be sure to check out all of that great content and our newly refurbished website at selfdefenseradio.net. And by the time you hear this, Armed Lutheran Radio will have topped 100,000 downloads all time. I want to thank you all for that. We really appreciate your support. If you enjoy the content, if you like the show, we've got a membership site called the Reformation Gun Club where you can get access to audio segments that were never released, full-length, unedited versions of my interviews with special guests, roundtables, and our Clinging to God and Gun segment. Oftentimes those are trimmed down for time, and the um, the content that's available on the Gun Club does not include any of those edits. Uh, you can join the Reformation Gun Club for less than $2 a month, and you get access to hundreds of audio files, discounts from companies like Cook's Holsters, easy-to-see targets, uh, Talon Gun Grips, Gun Box, Gun Safes, and lots more plus access to our closed Facebook group and other opportunities to interact with the cast. Check it out at gunclub.armedlutheran.us. All right, so what have we got on tap today for episode 117? As I mentioned, Sergeant Bill has just finished a two-day class with world champion Ben Steger. Um, He, on his way to the Texas State Championship, recorded his thoughts about that, so you'll be hearing that in his Ballistic Minute today. Mia brings us another motivations segment talking about the need to support the organizations that fight for our rights, which is a great intro or sort of lead in to the NRA annual convention, which is coming next weekend. And Pastor John Bennett and I will be dissecting a listener submitted article in Clinging to God and Guns. It's a little bit different article this week. It is a straight up news story about some churches that have banded together and pledged not to call the police for any reason whatsoever. All that is coming your way next after this brief timeout. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio on the Self-Defense Radio Network. Hey, if you're like me, you like shopping at gun shows. No pressure from sales staff, no need to bother them to ask to look at stuff. You just pick stuff up and dry fire it and look at it and hold it. Imagine if you could get that experience at your local gun store where you don't need to bother anybody. You don't have to ask people for help if you don't need it. You don't have salespeople hovering over your shoulders. Well, this is what it's like when you shop at G4G Guns. Cassie and Patrick Coburn are the owners, and you've heard them on the program before. They are absolutely awesome people, and they'll help you find exactly the right gear for you. But there's no sales pressure. You just browse the store. You pick up and hold anything that you want to look at without asking permission, just like at the gun show. And once you've found the gun you want, or if you actually do need assistance, Patrick and Cassie are there to help. It's the best of both worlds, gun shop and gun show, in one place. It really is the best. G for G Guns. They're located at 2035 Central Circle, Suite 108 in McKinney, Texas. They're open Mondays from 1 to 6 Tuesday through Thursday, 11 to 7. And on the weekends, you'll find them at a gun show near you. Or check them out online at G4G Guns. That's G, the number 4, G, guns.com. G4G Guns, the gallery 
for great guns. G4GGuns.com. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill, and this is your Ballistic Minute. So I'm not in a squad car today, I'm actually driving to Wichita Falls for an IDPA match, the Texas State Championship. But I just got finished with a two-day class with Ben Steger, the USPSA national champion and IPSC world champion. I think Ben's won like eight national champions in a row. It's pretty impressive. He's quite a shooter. Uh, I did a two-day uh, Ben Steger advanced shooting skill builder class. Uh, you have to be a class A shooter or above in USPSA to even sign up for the class. And uh, I think we ended up shooting about about 2,000 rounds in two days. So he pretty much sets up a stage, has you run it, and then he runs it, and then talks about the ways you can analyze stages and, and run them a little bit better. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking, well, I don't shoot USPSA, I only shoot IDPA. Well, practical shooting sports are practical shooting sports. They're actually more similar now than they ever have been. And shooting skills are shooting skills. Uh, to me, IDPA is a great game to play. USPSA is too. I shoot them both because they're both fun. They both have different skills. IDPA is more geared towards concealed carry defensive shooting scenarios. USPSA is more just how fast can you shoot? What are your, you know, what's your skill level? How fast can you do this and do that? So, <clears throat> in the class, we, uh, after we you know do the stage he had a couple other bays where we had skills that we would work on for about an hour or so and then he'd rotate and you know different groups would go through different deals and and he'd come over and help us out critique us give us some advice in that nice gruff a Ben Steger way which is pretty awesome being a police officer I, I like that kind of gruff mentality that that you know abrasive way of handling people so it was kind of old hat to me and it, it was interesting to see the way he would run a stage after we did it and then you know one of the biggest things that I noticed in the class was the amount of effort that he would put into shooting from one position to another position and you know he always say go from one position to another position as quick as you can but really most shooters don't move as quick as they can and I mean maximum effort that was something that Ben said several times in the last two days maximum effort from one position to the next position downshift and then make your shots it was amazing I learned a lot I think I've actually gonna be a much much better shooter after two days and about 2,000 rounds with Ben Steger so thank you to Ben Steger if you haven't signed up for a class the advanced skill builder class may be a little bit too advanced for you, you may not even qualify for it <clears throat> he has skills and drills classes he has um, regular shooting USPSA classes I'm not saying you have to go with Ben but if you haven't been out and shot an instructional course with a good instructor you don't know what you're missing out on different instructors teach things different ways I mean they're all teaching the same things the fundamentals of shooting and executing it but some of them teach it in different ways and others teach it in their way and you're not going to get better just by self-analyzing and doing it yourself it's always better to have someone see what you're doing that is at a higher skill level and say hey do this don't do that or try this don't try that I mean we do it in every other sport why wouldn't you do it in practical shooting sports? So, sorry about my voice. Uh, it's been a rough week. We've um, had a real tough week in the Dallas Police Department this week. And uh, uh, hopefully, well, I, I know there's prayers across the city, across the state, and across the nation for my fellow officers that are fighting for their life, that have lost their life, and those of us that are 
struggling to uh, move on from this terrible incident. So, thank you to everyone who supports the Arm Luther Radio Podcast, listens to my Ballistic Minute, who supports your local police departments. Do me a favor, when you see that police officer, go up and tell him, thank you for your service. We support you, and it'll make their day. I guarantee it. I'm Sergeant Bill. This has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Department and master class competitive shooter. You can watch Sergeant Bill's shooting videos at armedlutheran.us forward slash Sergeant Bill. Hey guys, just a quick message here. The fights going on to protect our rights seem to be endless. Uh, you know, the left likes to complain about all the money involved in politics and how the NRA has bought and paid for all of these politicians in Washington. The truth is that the anti-gun lobby has very deep pockets as well, funding those those efforts to take away your rights. And that's why I suggest, uh, I recommend that you fight for your rights by joining one or more of the national organizations that fight for your rights every day. You'll find links to those organizations where you can join and, and uh, support the fight Join the NRA. The NRA is not perfect, and no organization is. I've got my disagreements with some of the things at the NRA, but I am a life member, and I always will be. Uh, I would recommend you join as well. I am a member, I am a life member of the Second Amendment Foundation. If you want to see the lawsuits against the anti gunners go forward, support the Second Amendment Foundation. And I'm a life member of the Gun Owners of America. If you want a real no compromise group, join the GOA. All three of those organizations, their links are on my website at armedlutheran.us. Look for the Fight for Your Rights section in the sidebar on the right. Click and join all of those groups. Join your local organizations as well, your state organizations. They need your support and they're fighting for your rights at the local level as well. Be sure to get in the fight. Don't sit by and let everybody else do it for you. The fight never ends. So be sure to join the national and state organizations that fight for your rights every day. Up next, it's Mia's Motivations with Mia Anstein. Hey, guys. I am happy to be talking with you again. I am making a long trek back from the Capitol here in Colorado. I attended Sportsman's Day at the Capitol, which is an event that the House here in Colorado has every year to honor sportsmen in the state, which I think is outstanding. And it's especially important because just like there is the attack on our gun rights, there's also an attack on hunting rights. So, and I say rights, but hunting is a privilege and there's a lot of people who are fighting to take that away. And I wanted to take a minute as I'm driving to urge you, not just to support hunting, but to support your gun rights and other rights in the state. Religious, um, that's a big thing. There are a lot of attacks. There are some insane laws that have been passed already and are headed to the governors in California where you, um, you will not be allowed to sell or give advice if it is involving an exchange of money regarding religion if it pertains to any type of sexual orientation. So there's a lot going on in a lot of states and a lot of people are sleeping right now and not paying attention as this stuff is passing in their states. I sat in the house yesterday morning as a next generation's finance bill passed in support of hunting that will actually give our conservation department some extra money because right now we're funded solely by hunter and angler funds and so that'll get some more money going that way but there also uh, there were the moms demand action their group was there at the capitol in force in bright red clothing and they were there to visit and talk with their legislators so i urge you to look at yourself look in the mirror what are you doing to make an influence in your state how are you 
preserving our rights? How are you saving religion? How are you doing these things? And I want you, I know we all have jobs. We all have things to do. For me, it's a six-hour drive to the Capitol. I did. I went and I made a presence, tried to develop some more relationships in addition to the ones I already have. But you can do this too. You don't have to make these long drives if you can't afford to take a day off from work. But you know what you can do is you can make a phone call and you can leave a voicemail on your representative's message machine. You might even get a call back. I've gotten phone calls back from senators and representatives and they will talk to you because you know what a lot of them realize that they are in a position to represent you the people I want you to just stop and do this the emails they're great but emails you know what you do with your emails if you have too many in the inbox I'm not really sure how much of a difference that makes but if they hear your voice that's very important and this week that's my advice to you there's a lot of gun rights laws that we already know of some for increasing the age to buy firearms there's some to ban ARs there's some to all these laws there's a lot on the books and you need to know what's going on in your state and you need to call your representatives and you need to tell them to make pro-gun votes and to turn down all these anti-gun votes. Until next week, I hope that you guys will start to take action. Have a great one. Bye, guys. You can read more from Mia and watch her YouTube videos at MiaAnstein.com. Hey, if you need a good holster, let me take a minute to tell you about my good friends at Cook's Holsters. If you've got a need for a holster, for a carry gun, for competition, for a day at the range, check out Cook's Holsters at cooksholsters.com. They're American-made Kydex holsters, custom-made for your specific firearm with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And trust me, they stand by that guarantee. I know because I've seen it in action. Great people. You've heard Bob Cook on the podcast a couple of times. Uh, Over the last couple of years, he usually comes in at the end of the year on our Christmas show and talks about what's new for the coming year. Um, He makes a fantastic product, and you will not be disappointed. Trust me, I have been using their holsters for years. I started, I found them when I started doing reviews of holsters back when, in the pre-podcast days, back when I was blogging, and... I just I love the product and I and I trust it with my own life. You should give them a shot as well. Check them out at cooksholsters.com. Use the promo code Armed Podcast and get 10% off your order. Check them out. Cooksholsters.com today. Up next, we're clinging to God and guns with Pastor John Bennett. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Time now for Clinging to God and Guns, where we analyze and debunk articles and videos that try to take scripture to support a position in the gun rights debate. Joined again, as always, by our good friend, the pistol packing pastor himself, John Bennett. Pastor, welcome back. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, how are you healed up? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you so much for filling in last week. I appreciate it. Well, today we've got something a little bit different. It's, it's an article sent to us by a listener from the Washington Post via MSN, and it's entitled, Churches Make a Drastic Pledge in the Name of Social Justice to Stop Calling the Police. And it starts like this. First Congregational Church of Oakland, and that would be Oakland, California, shares a neighborhood with many homeless people who often come to the church in times of mental health crises. Sometimes church members feel unequipped to deal with the erratic behavior. The most heart-wrenching scenes, volunteer leader Nicola Torbett says, are the times when the church is closing for the day and a person with nowhere to go absolutely refuses to leave the building. At least once or twice a month, at their wit's end, the church members call 911. Now the church has joined a small handful of like-minded congregations with a radical goal, to stop calling the police. Not for mental health crises, not for graffiti on their buildings, not even for acts of violence. These churches believe the American police system 
criticized for its impact, especially on people of color, is such a problem that they should wash their hands of it entirely. Mm. <laughs> so before we delve into the, the, the political motivations, the, the, the social motivations, let's talk about the practical effect of this kind of a policy, right? On the one hand, you got a troubled soul who comes to the church looking for guidance and solace. The last thing you really want to do is say, is look at your watch and say, yep, oh, it's beer 30, time to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and kick them to the curb. You know, it, it's a, it doesn't send the message that you're a, a you know, a, a, a compassionate church. If you're kicking people out, uh, if you're not ministering to the downtrodden. Yeah, there's a, there, there's a practical solution to this without turning the stupid up to level 11. Um, <laughs> You know, you could get a a list of volunteers for your church that, okay, yes, we're in Oakland. We have this problem with homelessness. And it's not, I mean, it's the entire Bay Area because let's just face it, the state of California and especially these metropolitan areas, the homelessness problem is caused by liberal policy and a refusal to address mental illness in many cases. Right. Um, so, you know, for the sake of compassion and seeing this as an opportunity to share the gospel that could potentially transform somebody's life, you get a list of volunteers. Mm -hmm. Okay. People are slated for a block of time. They get called. Can you just come sit with this person until, you know, they're at peace and they can find a place to stay for the night and so forth. The other thing is that these places, there are a plethora. Would you say I have a plethora boss? Um, <laughs> They have a plethora of homeless shelters. And so it's not like these people don't have any place to go. Right. But then we get to the part of refusing to call the police, even for acts of violence. Mm -hmm. And they get more into that here in just a minute. It's uh, At some point, though, even with a volunteer staff and even with that kind of policy, and even if you even if you have a program where you find this person somewhere to go, right? You maybe partner with local shelters and work it out. Hey, we've got this guy. He won't leave. He needs somewhere to stay. What if the guy won't get up and leave? What if he's just determined to stay in your church? Do you stay open 24 hours a day? Do you let the guy sit there in his mental illness or, or do at some point, does it become compassionate to turn to the state the police to, to get this person some help. Well, and that's what they should be doing because let's face it, you know, the homeless community, the, these homeless people talk to one another mm -hmm. and you get a guy and he goes to his buddies the next day. Hey, I got this church to, to stay open all night long just because I was there. Pretty soon the church is going to be running a de facto homeless shelter instead of doing the work of the gospel. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, and, and I, the other side of it too is that they're just enabling these people instead of helping them to get out of their situation. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking with the police thing. It, it, for for some of these people, they're out on the streets. They they don't have any any kind of follow up on you know they're they're not taking their meds. They're they're left to themselves. They got nobody following up. Police, even though I mean jail sounds bad, but. If you can get those people off the streets, they get somewhere safe to sleep for the night, you get an evaluation done, maybe follow up, uh, remand them to a, a mental health facility where they can be supervised, they can be cared for, somebody can make sure they're taking their meds. Jail might be the first step towards getting care that they, dra that they desperately need. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, it's just like an emergency room situation where you triage patients, mm -hmm. where you have to determine, okay, Who's in the most desperate need of care? Why are they in desperate need of care? Okay, you've got this guy who's schizophrenic. Let's get him help. You've got this other guy who's just a drunk. Let's get him sobered up. Um, it's Homelessness is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have known people who were homeless, and it's heartbreaking. If you're wondering why implement this policy, you probably already could guess from, from that last paragraph, but... They come out and explain it in this next one with a quote from, from Ms. Torbett. Can this actually be reformed when it was actually created for the unjust distribution of resources 
or to police black and brown bodies, end quote. For her and for her fellow church members, the answer is no. The police don't just need reform. They need to be abandoned altogether. Um, So there you have it. Not calling the police because they're racists who only exist to unjustly distribute resources. And we saw this with a lot of the Black Lives Matter crowd, how you had a group in New York City of all places. Is, is New York City a violent place? In parts, yeah. Yeah. They were asking for the complete abandonment of police. Right. right. <laughs> they wanted to disband the police, eliminate the police altogether, and self-police their communities. Yep. What would be the end result of that? You would have the gangbangers who are armed to the hilt running the joint. Well, we saw the practical effect of that in Baltimore. Remember, the the mayor called, told the police to sort of back away from their typical aggressive policing, and now violence spiked last year, and then the community leaders, quote-unquote, were crying out, why don't we have police in our neighborhoods? <laughs> well, that's what you asked for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the exact opposite of of the uh, let them eat cake, you know, from <laughs> back in France's history. So you had the people crying, "Let us eat cake," and the government says, "Fine, we'll give you a cake." And then they say, "We're tired of it." Uh, yep, exactly. There's another side to this too. That um, when I first saw this article, when you sent it to me, that you've got this is Oakland. This is the Bay Area. This is in essence, a, a sanctuary city. Mm-hmm. And just Google illegal immigrant rape, illegal immigrant murder, illegal immigrant uh, breaking and entering, whatever, whatever the crime may be. And there's been a slew of crimes committed by illegal immigrants. The most heartbreaking one was a story of a, a in New Jersey of a six-year-old girl getting raped in the middle of the night by an illegal immigrant who broke into the house. Mm -hmm. Um, so they say they're not even going to call the police for, for violence. So if, if, if a homeless man, well, and they're not even saying in regards to homelessness, but anybody in general. So if, you know, there's a youth event at your church and some thug comes in and grabs the little girl and decides to do something horrific to her, are you just not going to call the police? These churches that are signing up for this, they're setting themselves up for huge legal liabilities with this. Yeah, I, I, there was a, a little bit later they, they talk about this, and I, I thought, and that came to mind, that they're just, they're asking for trouble um, beyond just, I mean, wor- worse than having a, uh, you know, the popo show up on their, on their property. They're, they're, they're setting themselves up for some serious legal liability. The churches, it says, uh, back to our article, the churches call their drastic approach, quote, divesting from policing. One headline after another about policing around the country shows that it's necessary. Most recently, events include a notorious call to police about two African-American men at a Philadelphia Starbucks and the fatal shooting of Stefan Clark shot eight times as he was holding an iPhone, not a gun. Interesting that they don't tell the full story. No, and this may have been written, like, I didn't check. I should have checked the timeline. But this may have been written immediately after the Starbucks thing when everybody was screaming bloody murder and nobody was actually waiting for the facts. The The Starbucks thing is similar, if you think about it, to what they're talking about having going on at their church, where somebody right. comes in and simply won't leave. You had it, it had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the two guys were African-American. Two black guys walk into Starbucks in Philadelphia, into a Starbucks, I shouldn't say Starbucks like there's only one, and they sit down at a table and don't purchase anything. And they refuse to purchase anything when they're asked. And so what they're doing is they're taking up space that a paying customer could use. This is a private business, and no matter what your skin color is, you don't have a right to squat. Right. Well, there is a, what also came out along with this is that there was an incident and another Starbucks where an, a uniformed police officer was denied use of the restroom because he wasn't a paying customer. Mm-hmm. And that was, and he was white. So it had right. nothing to do with skin color, not to mention the fact that the manager of this Starbucks who uh, was asking these men to leave was a liberal SJW. Yes. 
And if you listen to, they released a 911 call from this Starbucks. And it's, it's hilarious because the, the manager of the Starbucks refers to these two gentlemen who refuse to leave. They won't buy anything and they refuse to leave. Two and gentlemen. they got arrested because when the police asked them to leave, they refused. Right. So at that point, you're trespassing, you're breaking the law, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your skin color. So that whole story turned out to be a lie. And Black Lives Matter and that whole movement jumped the shark on it and absolutely went crazy blaming Starbucks for racism. The CEO came out and basically assumed that his entire, every employee in the company, 175,000 employees nationwide are a bunch of racists and need retraining. Now, the Stefan Clark shooting, that's tragic. It's a completely different thing. I'm not going to try to excuse it. I, I'll be the first to admit I don't know enough of the details to really comment on it, but that's a completely different thing. You're talking about yeah. police facing a guy who they think might be armed and making a mistake potentially. Yeah, that was a huge mistake. And But in that case, the police had received a call of someone breaking into vehicles who happened to be Stephen Clark, and he ran from police. And they were, from my understanding of it, they were incredibly hasty when they confronted him mm -hmm. that they said, Sh you know, you hear the uh, the audio show us your hands and not a second later they're saying gun and they're pulling the trigger. Um, so that right. was, that was a failure on everybody's part. And sadly, because of it, there's a guy who, I mean, even if he had engaged in some petty criminal behavior, didn't deserve to die for it. Right. And we've seen this. It, it's not like this is happening every day. That's another thing that's overblown. We, just like the, the idea that we have mass shootings every day, day in America or every week in America, we don't have police hunting down black people and shooting them willy nilly. Police do shoot civilians of all colors. Uh, sometimes they shouldn't. That doesn't mean that every time a black kid gets shoot by, shot by police, that it's because the cops racist or because the police department is racist. racist. That's the, that narrative is the hallmark of Black Lives Matter. And it's been that way ever since Obama called that white cop stupid who arrested skip gates breaking into his own house and it's been just downhill ever since that's what led to ferguson that's what led to baltimore and protests all over the country and it's all been based on a lie yeah it's it's all based on a lie that and statistically speaking you're more likely to get shot if you are white than if you are black uh, mm -hmm. studies have shown that they actually show more restraint because of the you know, racial element of it that police in many cases show more restraint when facing a, a black suspect than when facing a white suspect. Yep. Yep. All right. Moving on. The project of divesting is organized by showing up for racial justice and their, um, their acronym is surge S U R J a nationwide organization that tries to get white Americans working on behalf of racial justice. The four Unitarian and Protestant churches that have joined so far include three in the Bay Area and one in Iowa City. The, that's quite a, a <laughs> ways away. I've yeah. been through Iowa City. It is the most podunk farm town you've seen, so I don't get that one. I mean, maybe Cletus has shown up too many times drunk at the local church and they're trying to help him out. I don't know. <laughs> A very forward-thinking Iowa church, I guess. Um, <laughs> the Northern California Nevada Conference of the United Church of Christ has signed on to recruit from among its member churches, and the Bay Area churches are talking to more congregations in their area from denominations including the Disciples of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA. Now, notice they don't lump Unitarian and Protestant together. They don't just, <laughs> why is that? Protestants and are Christians and Unitarians are heretics, but I digress. Right. Unitarians, you can be an atheist and be a member of a Unitarian church. Right. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> it's a challenging ask, acknowledges Reverend Ann Dunlap, a United Church of Christ minister who leads Surge's outreach to faith communities. It's a big ask to invite us as white folks to think differently about what safety means. Why do, who do we rely on? What is safe? For whom? 
Should our safety be predicated on violence for other communities? I have no idea what that means. And if not, what do we do if we're confronted with a situation because we are, as congregations, how do we handle it if there's a burglary? How do we handle it if there's a situation of violence or abuse in the congregation? Yeah, I can see where that's a huge ask. <laughs> like, hey, yes. don't, don't bother with police if some vagrant comes in and stabs a member of your congregation in the neck. Don't worry about it. Or look at this more practically. You know, if you are, and of course, there's there's no gangs in Oakland because it's a veritable, you know, socialist utopia, right? Exactly. <sighs> so word gets out. And, you know, if, if I'm in one of these gangs and, you know, we could use a little more funds to increase our arsenal of weapons or to buy another brick of Coke. Yes. Hey, the local church, they're passing around that collection plate. Let's just all sit in the back, and after the collection's done, let's pull out our guns and demand the offering. And, hey, they're not going to call the cops on us, so let's do it. Exactly right. <laughs> Morons. I didn't, I didn't think about that one. But you, you mentioned Oakland, and that's a great point. I, I, I was just watching – I just finished watching the two seasons of this series on Netflix called Dope, and each each episode focuses on a different aspect of the of the drug war. And each episode is in a different city. And the very first episode is Oakland, California. And Oakland and each of the cities that they focus on, drugs and gangs and crime are exploding. Yes. And, and Oakland is one of the worst. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. I was thinking about this. What happens? You get burglarized or like you say, you get some guys come in and, and they hold you up for the collection plate or, you know, your, all of your altarware gets stolen there's damage to the church. You don't call the police. You don't file a police report. Well, there's no way you're going to get an insurance claim to fix all of that or replace anything that's lost if you won't file a police report. Right. Yes, because in many of these cases, insurance says if there's no police report, we're not doing anything for you. Exactly. And they shouldn't. I mean, anybody could take advantage of that and just get free goodies not calling police and just saying, hey, I got burglarized. <laughs> we need some more communion wine. Um, <laughs> let's call the insurance company. They'll take care of it. Let's be honest. They're probably not using communion wine. They're probably using grape juice. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they stole all the Welches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, those are hard questions. <laughs> the churches that commit to ending their use of police resources are training members. And here's where I think it gets really dangerous. They're training members in alternate responses to danger. Torbett said at First Congregational, church leaders have invited experts from several nonprofits to train members on de-escalating mental health crises and on self-defense in case of a violent person at church. Our goal is to never call the police, she said. As members discuss self-defense, they've also decided they will not arm anyone at the church with a weapon, any weapon. Mm. So... I can see the benefit of de-escalation training where you're, if you're trying to avoid conflict and, and violence in your church, especially if it's going to come down to members of your staff having to deal with a potentially violent person uh, who won't leave your, your, your church building. Self-defense training, always a good thing if it's done right. But I can see this, I can see this backfiring on the church big time. If a guy pulls out a knife or a gun as your staff tries to you know, coax them out the door and somebody gets shot or they get cut, stabbed, whatever, what do you do then? You're still not calling police? Because it's if not. You, <laughs> is the church going to end up being liable? I, I'm sure they will. Legally, civilly, if somebody gets hurt and they refuse to call the police to deal with it? Well, what are they going to do? They're going to call 911 and say, somebody's been stabbed. Can you send an ambulance? Oh, by the way, don't send the police. <laughs> Right. <laughs> just the 911 dispatcher is going to send the police. That's right. So what are they going to do? Just let the person bleed out so that the police won't show up? They need their own church ambulance service, see, right? So that they throw you in the back of the, of the minivan and drive you down to the hospital, no questions asked. <laughs> <sighs> this is just so incredibly stupid. It, it really is. And what do you think? It, what do you think it's going to take for this policy to be dropped like a hot potato? I mean, sadly, I think it's going to take somebody getting killed. The next Charleston shooter. Yes. Yes. 
they're going, they'll, they'll, somebody comes to Bible study and start shooting. They'll be calling 911 faster than you can say believers baptism. I mean, they're not going <laughs> to, they're not, this policy is going to be great until it goes into, I mean, they're going to think they're doing a great thing here until the reality of that violence comes and finds them and they have to have somebody to help. You know, at the very least, they should have like a little basket by the door with rocks that says, please take one for self-defense as you enter the church. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> they can't have any weapons, right? Well, but I'm saying after that first person gets Oh, killed. right. Gotcha. But right. yeah, it's just... Or the little mini bats. <laughs> like the one they pass out as souvenirs at baseball games? There's a, there is a... Uh, there's a school system. I don't remember where I, I saw this article. You know, there was the one uh, school system somewhere that said they were going to have buckets of rocks in the, <laughs> in the school, in the classes. There's another that's going to be passing out mini bats. Honest to God, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, because Jimmy and Tommy aren't going to try to hit each other with them at any cost, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what could go wrong? Oh, man. <laughs> At the very least, why not tasers? Why not pepper spray? Why not non-lethal means of self-defense? Jesus We're... didn't carry a taser. Oh. You know that. You're right. We should, just, <laughs> we should just be armed with the Holy Spirit. That's right. I hate to laugh, but what else can you do? I mean, you're, you're faced with such... These people live in an alternate universe, it seems, because they have no perception of the reality of the world we live in none absolutely none they they obviously have not thought about the practical effect of this policy and they go a step further in this next paragraph the leaders involved in the surge effort say that they're not asking churchgoers not to call the police in their lives outside the church though they hope that some will choose to do so talk about a tough sell mm -hmm. <laughs> don't even bother calling police if something happens at your house <laughs> Join our church. We want you to be helpless. <laughs> That's right. <sighs> and here's here's what is so frustrating about all this. It's like they've taken Romans 13 out of their Bibles. Because Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. And then in a few, just a few verses later, when it's talking about the, the authorities, it's saying, he is God's servant for your good. Right. Yes, there are law enforcement officers that, that do bad things. There are some bad apples out there, and there are some guys that just make stupid mistakes that sadly end somebody's lives once in a while. And it's horrific and it's tragic. But the bottom line is that these law enforcement officers are serving in that role for our good. Yes. Well, think of this parallel, too. I just thought of this. If, if you know, you want to paint all police with, a, with this broad brush that they're, they're violent and that they're, they like beating people up and they don't like black folks, think about all of the abuse that happens at the hands of church workers pastors, mm -hmm. preachers, and priests. That doesn't mean the church is a bad thing. That doesn't mean the institution as a whole is, is immoral or, or dangerous or needs to be abandoned. It means you've got sinners in, the, in your congregations. You have sinners in your police departments. It's, you have sinners everywhere. It doesn't mean that you throw the whole thing out just because some people give in to their, to their sin or do, do the wrong things or make bad decisions. Now, what happens in one of these churches if it's found out that the pastor has been sexually abusing children? Do they not call the police? Right. And that gets back to that, you know, they talk about divesting from policing. Uh, you know, the, the Webster's defines divest as depriving or dispossessing, especially of property, authority, or title. And like you were talking about with Romans 13, they still have that authority. Just because you won't call them doesn't mean they don't have the authority to come and arrest people. You're, what you're doing is you're depriving yourself of the benefits of having the protection that law enforcement provides. Yes, exactly right. So, uh, you know, I talk about this in, and, and you, were, you were touching on this a moment ago, 
I talk about this in, in this week's uh, midweek meditation, the, the, the idea that, you know, some people will say, well, well, I don't need a weapon. I don't need a gun if I have faith. And these people are basically saying we don't need to use the police. Isn't this sort of telling, well, no, it's not even telling your congregation that you, you don't need police because the, the Lord will protect you. This is, this is asking your congregation to overlook evil and to allow evil to be perpetrated and not call the authorities to deal with it. Yes. How far are they willing to take this? You know, that, that's my question. When I first read this, that was my question. How far are they willing to take this? It'll be interesting to see when something, like you said, when something does happen. Uh, if it's just for the random vagrant who's in need of mercy, that's one thing. But mm-hmm. when they're talking about not even calling the police because of acts of violence, that just it blows my mind how stupid that is. You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. All right, back to the author. Many of the churches that Surge approached were not interested. I'm shocked to hear that. I had some hard conversations with pastors and members, Dunlap said. These were progressive congregations that had participated in our work in the past. They hung Black Lives Matter banners and had them vandalized. They said, you know, we appreciate our relationship with the police. We don't want to put that at risk. To Dunlap, resisting policing is among her religious obligations. You're talking about state violence against communities, she says. You have to speak up and take a stand about that. There's not a nice way just to play in the middle, she says. There's not a way to reform our way out of police violence, but to dismantle policing as a system. So resisting policing is a religious obligation? Yeah. Again, let's just throw out Romans 13, I guess. (laughs) And, and let's look at, let's take an example from the Bible. I mean, the Jews were oppressed by the Romans. The early Christians were oppressed by the Jews. And yet Christ, neither Christ nor his followers ever once said, we need to tear down the establishment. We need to dismantle the empire. Not one time. It's interesting, too, that keep in mind, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, to the Christians in Rome, and he's saying to honor the authorities because they are there for your good. And it wouldn't be short, soon after that, that Emperor Nero would begin probably the worst persecution of Christians during the time of the early church. Right. But, you know, if everybody took this attitude, what would happen to churches? What would happen with the current state of affairs, with the discrimination? You know, the discrimination that we see now would lead to outright persecution from the, from the secular society. Yep. So Dunlap, they say, envisions instead a form of local accountability in which neighbors get to know one another and defend their own communities. This sounds kind of like, you know, into the world prepping kind of stuff. (laughs) Um, Chuck Wexler, the executive director for the Police Executive Research Forum, which conducts studies on improving policing, said churches can and should take some tasks themselves instead of calling police, like providing assistance to a person who's drunk or sick. But he cautioned that churches would be foolhardy to try to take the place of police in a violent situation, especially if the aggressor has a gun in a tragic case like the church shootings in Charleston, South Carolina and Sutherland Springs, like we just said. As soon as that happens, this policy goes right in the waste bin. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine that church council meeting. Well, that didn't work. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. I shouldn't laugh because it will be tragic if and when that happens. And it I, will. I it doesn't, but. Moreover, Wexler believes clergy can use their moral influence to make police departments better. Quote, I understand where these folks may be coming from. They're saying we have issues. But if you have issues, you shouldn't cut yourself off from such important institutions in the community. Communities have one police force. If they're not doing what you want them to do, you should be engaged with them, he said, pointing to examples of clergy in Los Angeles, Boston, and Chicago who worked with officers on reducing gang violence and other community priorities. It's disappointing to hear when a community or religious organization decides that they're not going to engage with the police anymore, he says. Police need the church, and they need an active clergy. They rely on them, end quote. This makes me think about the, the, the morons in the March for, live, for Our Lives movement, you know, the gun rights debate. You start from this position that the other side is evil. They're murderers. They're racist. There's nothing good about them. You got to just get rid of them. 
right? We got to get rid of the police force and abandon it altogether. We got to get rid of guns. We got to, you know, the NRA is evil. The same arguments are made in both of these kinds of cases. You can't have any meaningful conversation once you, if you start from that point, you can't solve any real problems because you can't work together. Yeah, you, you, there's, you're not starting on any common ground. Right. On the one hand, you've got one group saying the police are bad, we don't need them. And the other hand, you're saying you have a group of people that are saying, hey, wait a minute, there's a <laughs> lot of good that police do. Why don't we take a look at the good that they can do, and then we can focus on how we can reduce the bad that happens. Yes. No talk about, hey, maybe we should have these police officers go through some more regular force-on-force training. Mm -hmm. Um have them work through these scenarios on a more frequent basis. Have them have better training. You know, that's never brought up. Rather, it's the police are bad. Let's demonize the police because they're all a bunch of racists. And and there's never an attempt to actually deal with the underlying problem, which is gangs and violence. And just because the gangbanger happens to be black doesn't mean that when you arrest him you're, or shoot him, it, you're doing it because he's black. The, these communities, especially places like Oakland, Atlanta, you know, New York, Chicago, Detroit, you've got uh, rampant gang activity, and it's typically in these minority communities, not because they're minorities. It just happens to be that these minority communities is where the police have the most interaction with the, with the community directly face-to-face, one-on-one, and it's usually not a positive, a positive interaction. It's usually trying to arrest somebody <laughs> or, right. you know, responding to a, a shooting or a murder or whatever. So in addition to, okay, let's look at how we can improve, improve policing. We also need to look at and accept the reality that we got some problems in our inner city communities that need to be addressed as well. 25% of all homicides are committed by African American men ages 14 to 24. So you have 1% of the entire population committing Roughly one quarter of all homicides. And 50% of the homicides in this country are committed by gang members. Yes. Which, so so we've, if you won't accept those facts and look at the reality that we've got a problem both in terms of policing and how we're, we're responding to crime, but also the, the fact that there, is the, there are these crimes predominantly in these, in these minority communities, we got to address both sides of that equation or we're never going to get anywhere. But this, this all started, if you go back to the 90s with the Clintons, you don't negotiate with the other side, you demonize them. You convince people that the, the people that you're, you're up against politically are evil. And, and the problem that that, cr- that mentality created is that once you do that, you can't negotiate. There's no way you can compromise. There's no way you can talk. You can't even talk to the other side because how do you negotiate with people that you just yesterday, you were calling terrorists and murderers and racists and killers. Yeah, you can't. And, and, and if you do that, then it calls, then your, your honesty gets called into question. And the people that were supporting you say that and say, wait a minute, didn't you just call them? racists last week? How, how can you be talking to them? So you start losing your support. So you're stuck in having to perpetuate this, you know, police are bad, police are bad, police are bad, and nothing ever changes. Dunlap said that even in the case, that even in a case of criminal behavior, she would ideally like to see churches not call the police because she doesn't trust the criminal justice system to deliver a fair outcome. In the case of interpersonal violence, she says, for the survivors as well as the perpetrators, we want to look at transformative justice. Would a punitive police and legal system actually bring us the desired outcome for everyone involved? She doesn't define what the desired outcomes are. What are our actual values? What do our traditions teach us about redemption, she says. I would like to sit down with her and ask her how she felt about the verdict for Kate Stanell's killer. Kate Steinle? Oh, or yes. Kate Steinle, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Kate Steinle's killer, yeah. Because well, here you had uh, you had an illegal immigrant who uh, negligently shot some poor woman and basically got off. Mm-hmm. Well, you look at the reaction to the O.J. Simpson case. All the evidence is there that he did it, but because of all of the because the perception that the police department is racist in Los Angeles, it was like okay, 
we're we're going to we're going to stick it to the man. We we want to make sure that that we win one for our side this time, even though they knew the guy was was guilty as sin. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> That's right. So they probably look at Kate Steinle's murder and say, "Hey, happens in the black community all the time." Now you see what it's like for us. And there's no way to, if that's your point of view and you, and when some, when a human being loses their life, no matter what their color, if they happen to be the other color and you say, well, you know, that happens to us all the time. There's no way if we can't see the common humanity and and look past the skin color, there's no way we get, we move forward. So, so she talks about our, our actual values. She says it there at the end, what are our actual values? So, what are their values? She doesn't define them here and she doesn't explain what the desired outcome is. It's basically assumed that the desired outcome is that black people don't get arrested no matter what they do. So what are their values? If you're, if you're, if your hatred for police is such that you don't trust any police officer to treat you fairly, what does that say about your values? And oddly enough, many of those, uh, instances where police have acted poorly, it goes back to the days of, of segregation. Mm-hmm. Um, and hey, we moved beyond that as an entire country. But no, no, Can't we still that. have to blame the police. Well, unfortunately, too, blaming Whitey and blaming the police is it, it, it's a way of, of gaining and maintaining power, right? You look at the at the current crop of of racial justice people like Sharpton and, and, uh, and Jesse Jackson. If you don't have racial strife, those people are out of jobs, right? They have, they have no power. They have no money. They don't have CNN calling them, asking them what they think every time a, a kid gets shot by the police. So they lose their status if race relations improve. So it's in and, their best interest to constantly blame white people and blame police for the problems in the black community rather than turning to their constituents and saying, Oh, Hey, you guys have a problem in your community too. We need to look at this from all sides. If you speak up about that, you get called a racist. Yep. Uncle Tom. Yep. So it's, it's in, it's in these leaders, quote unquote, it's in their best interest to keep that pot stirred than to actually try to solve problems. So then they finish up like this. That's a controversial position that members are discussing in each church. Sarah Pritchard, a co-pastor at another Oakland church has, that has signed on, Agape Fellowship, said while the pledge not to call police applies to the churches, not to individual members, the hope is that the training at church will inspire some members when they go home as well. When it comes to police and prisons, Pritchard uses an old word to describe a still radical stance, abolitionist. So they're saying that that the work of police is just as as evil as that of slave ownership. Yes. That's what I'm reading into that and by using you, that term, abolitionist. Yes, yeah. If you if you go back to the beginning of the article, this lady Nicola Torbett, the volunteer at the First Congregational Church of Oakland, says the police was actually created to police black and brown bodies, that the the purpose of the police is to keep black people down. So yes, they're tying this directly to slavery. Police are the modern slave owners, essentially. (sighs) Wow. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of, uh, there was absolutely no scripture in this. (laughs) They're just odd sort of offhand references to, to traditions and values. So, so final thoughts on this and this idea of divesting from police authority the uh, the only place i see this working out well is the amish community <laughs> <laughs> um you know let's let's look at but this the problem is that the amish make their own houses and furniture and That's i true. don't see that happening in in oakland <laughs> <laughs> no they're more likely to burn it down uh, <laughs> i i sorry i'm not i'm not trying to be insensitive um Looking at this, at, at the bigger picture, and looking at what Scripture tells us, that Paul plainly tells us that the authorities are instituted by God for our good, to punish wickedness and to encourage good. What happens when we divest ourselves, to use their language, of that benefit? 
yes, there are, are sinners in every walk of life. So you know what? Why don't we just call sin, sin, treat it as such, and then embrace the benefits that are provided by law enforcement? Why don't we embrace them and actually help them to do their job? Get within our communities and ask the police, what can we do to help you better protect this community? How can we work together to solve the problems of homelessness that we have in our community? This kind of approach is going to do nothing but exacerbate the problem because it takes the resources that are available to the churches in your community and just throws them in the garbage can. All right. Well, I think that uh, that pretty well covers it. Um, thank you to our listener for uh, for submitting this uh, this article, and thank you, Pastor, for uh, delving into it with me. It's nice to do something a little out of the ordinary once in a while. Yeah. And um, if you've got a, an article that you would like us to, to fisk, if you've got a, a video that you would like us to look at and to, to analyze on the show, visit our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback and, and send us a voice message or a voicemail or an email. Let us know. We would love to hear from you. And tune in again next time for another edition of Clinging to God and Guns right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Thank you all for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. Thank you to our fine sponsors who make all this possible. Thank you to my awesome cast of contributors. And thank you, dear listener, for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.